All right, guys, it's time for the next level guy show. A men's interview, interest, and improvement focused podcast featuring interviews with the greats from all industries to help you better your life. Each week, a new episode features an interview with one of the greats, covering all aspects of their story, from life hacks to tips and protocols that have allowed them to live life on the next level. We then highlight concrete action steps that you can use to improve your life. And now, your host, Ian Dawson McKay. And today's guest is Patrick McNamara, a.k.a. Mac. Mr. McNamara has 22 years of special operations experience, 13 of which were spent in a special mission unit. He has extensive experience in hostile fire combat zones in the Middle East and Eastern Europe. He trained individuals at basic and advanced levels of marksmanship and combat tactics with emphasis on the GWOT. Mac was his Tier 1 unit's primary advanced pistol and rifle marksmanship instructor for two years. In addition, he instructed advanced close quarter battle tactics, concealed weapon employment, high speed motorcade and non motorcade driving techniques, mountain and urban climbing, basic and advanced demolitions, advanced explosive entry techniques, and was the primary hand combat instructor, rewriting the pre existing POI. This guy knows his shit. Mr. McNamara led the Special Missions Unit on several high alpine, long distance, wilderness foot movements with emphasis on privatization. Mr. McNamara led and supervised a highly trained, multidisciplined special operations team having the highest priority for worldwide deployment. He routinely planned, implemented and conducted real world missions and exercises involving state of the art equipment. While serving as his unit's marksmanship NCO, Mr. McNamara developed his own marksmanship club with the NRA, CMP, which is the Civilian Marksmanship Program, and the USPSA, which is the United States Practical Shooting Association, affiliations. Mr. McNamara runs monthly IPSC matches and runs semi-annual military marksmanship championships to encourage marksmanship fundamentals on competitiveness through the Army. He retired five years ago from the Army's Premier Hostage Rescue Unit as a Sergeant Major. Mr. McNamara is the author of TAPS, which is the Tactical Application of Practical Shooting. And now, let's get to the interview. Well, thank you so much for coming on. It's an honour to have somebody on that I've been a big fan of for years. But for people who, yeah, a few people under a rock who don't know your name, could you give a quick introduction? Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm um, I'm a retired military guy. I did... Uh, 22 years in uh army special operations um so a myriad of different type of outfits and units um and uh i retired in 05 uh and i started working under my own banner t max inc in 2010 where i do uh tactical training uh shooting but close quarter battle um and a bunch of other small instruction stuff and then um uh started basically uh an internet business and gained a footprint on the internet and uh which is pretty cool you know because it's, it's it's a pretty big footprint right now um mm. started my own podcast uh, uh under the uh, university of badassery uh uh banner i do that with uh cj ortiz and uh, yeah, that's about it. I got a bunch of other small projects going on as well, you know, a bunch of other stuff. I love how you call them small and you've got like hundreds of thousands of followers, you know. Yeah. You're, you're becoming a legend in the, like the YouTube for your basic dude stuff. You've got your, you know, you're teaching people how to stay safe, how to protect themselves, their castle, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. But something that really surprised me was you were into sort of watching birds, you were into playing the violin when you were younger. How did you go from that? Because you've mentioned you watched your parents work ethic and that helped you build your discipline. Then you went into wrestling. Was it that that created the ball of controlled fury and sort of sophisticated gentlemen that we have in front of us? Or what, how do you think you shaped the part you are now? You know, it, 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 
it, it's it's very hard to tell. I um I yeah, as a kid, um I was into uh drawing and bird watching and playing the violin and I rode a unicycle to school and stuff like that. You know, very very yeah. quirky kid. Uh it, it wasn't into sports until until I got into them, but I was, you know, I was kind of a late bloomer in sports. I started wrestling when I was 14 years old. Uh it took me a couple of years to to win <laughs> a, a match. Uh, but once I won, I wanted more of that, you know, cause, cause I'd never been a winner before. I mean, just in, you know, in my parents' eyes, maybe I was a winner, but I'd never been a winner before. And then I, I wanted more of that, you know, tasting victory helped me uh, develop into the person that I am today. Uh, mm. Um, I wanted, uh, you know, to be better in the sport of wrestling, which means meant I had to be self-governed. I have to do stuff on my own. Uh, I got really good at that. And I knew when I re- graduated from high school, I wanted to do something challenging as well. And my dad was a big supporter of me joining the military. Uh, he didn't want me to go the route that I did. Uh, he wanted me to become an officer and, you know, go to a military academy and all this stuff. Thankfully, I did not have the aptitude for it <laughs> uh, and and went into um, special ops, which also required, though, a, a, a great amount of aptitude and, and um, uh, some you know, smarts because there was there's a lot of academic requirements and schooling when it comes to a career in special operations. Yeah. You've got to be pretty uh, switched on, but, but, but those things, those hobbies traveled with me, you know, the bird watching and the gardening, the music, hmm. all that stuff. I mean, it's, I didn't quit those, uh, the drawing. Uh, it, and it's a great vehicle of escapism, you know, because I could, I could drown myself in or just immerse myself in those hobbies uh, and stay busy without uh, or focusing or um, trying to, uh, you know, live a like a harder life. You know what I mean? I could, mm-hmm. I could, I could separate myself from being a ex commando and a fighter, and then working on my flower garden, which I love. You know, I love doing that. Stuff. I worked on my flower garden today for a couple hours. <laughs> I mean, what's that saying? It's better to be a warrior in a garden than a, a gardener in a war. That's True. right. And I've 100%. noticed that a lot of top performers, they have like the escapism, they have like the yoga or they have their drawing or something for the soul that can take mm-hmm. them away from that sort of passion, the fury. And I like that kind of dynamic that you live on both sides of the coin. You know, mm-hmm. that you're a nice, calm guy, but if you fuck with me, I'm going to mess you up. And yep, I really yep. like that kind of approach. And do you think you're always predestined for the military? Was there something else that potentially you could have gone in, do you think? Um, you know what? I I, th- I think predestined is probably more apropos than anything else because there was nothing else even on the back burner for me. I, I, I had mm-hmm. no plans after high school. You're like uh, me. So, <clears throat> yeah. So, and, and it was a perfect fit. I mean, I fit right into it and, uh, I, I signed up for something hard and I w- always wanted to level up what's next, what's next, what's next, what's next, you know, what's the, what's the, the next best, uh, unit that I could try out for, you know, and, and finally made it <clears throat> to the top of the heap in uh, in a, in a special missions unit in, in USASOC, United States operation, special operations command, uh, but you know, it, it wasn't without trial and tribulation. None of that stuff came easy. You know, people always look at me and hear about my past and my background, and and they think that you know I must have been just some super soldier who just smoked everything and was on a graduate of every school. But all of it came with you know a lot of trial, a lot of tribulation, a lot of failure. Um. Yeah, none of it was easy for me. Because that's a big thing that comes out in interviews. I've listened to your, you know, your the stuff you teach. You're not just going, I'm a fucking, I know it all. You're going, this is how I got my stuff. 
I failed here. This is what it taught me. This is how you can improve. I mean, you failed your the first diving school that you went to, but you always yeah. seem to have this amazing attitude of, okay, what's next? How can I improve? How can I get better? You're always going forward like Nick Kumulatus, who I've had on, and you're like Dean Stott, you know, living that sort of re- relentless life. Shameless plugs, I know. But what mm-hmm. what do they teach you, those kind of failures in like special ops in the military? How, how do they look at, get you to look at rejection, mistakes, these sorts of things? And how do they shape you to be a better person, do you think? It's not the end all be all. You know, when you fail something in the military, if you fail honorably, you know, in other words, you don't like quit. Um, a lot, a lot of times you're invited back and you kidding me. You're giving me a second chance, which is a great feeling, you know, to be given a second chance. So in life, when you're given a second chance and you don't take it, I'm like, what is wrong with you? Why wouldn't you take a second chance when you have the opportunity to succeed at something that you failed at? Why, why, why wouldn't you do that? And, 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 you know, and I was given a second chance at schools that sucked. I mean, they were fucking miserable, you know? I mean, I, yep. like I was a toe jumper in jump school, you know, it pulled my bicep into my forearm, broke my ribs, dislocated my shoulder. I got a concussion, but did I want to go back? Hell yeah. I wanted to go back. You know, I mean, that was my first failure. I was 18 years old. Um, but th- you know, they gave me an opportunity to come back and then the special forces course was another one. I failed that one. And they said, well, you know, it's a, it's a, it was a, like a demerit point system. It wasn't that I fell failed. Um, I failed with, with honor, you know, I mean, it, it wasn't like I cheated or quit or, um, did something unethical. So usually in a military school, unless you're breaking some kind of moral or ethical type, if, unless there's that kind of violation, you're usually going to be asked to come back. And I'm like, yeah. hell yeah, thank you. And, and I am I am going to come back and I'm going to smoke it next time. I love that part of your mentality. It's that kind of always forward. It's the, I want to right any wrong. I'm going to do it again and I'm going to achieve it. Do you think that's been a big part of your success even now that you're always looking, you're not resting on laurels, you're thinking, how can I improve my combat chassis? How can I improve my relationship? How can I train my guys better? How can I get my business better? Do you think that sense of success is in you? Yeah, I I, I would imagine so. You know, I never thought about it. Uh, but, but um, you know, you, you develop a certain mindset, right, when you're a, a, like a special ops guy for, for decades. So you develop a certain mindset that says, um, uh, it doesn't say stuff like never quit, drive on, you know, all that corny crap that you, you hear special ops guys say. Uh. It, 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 to me, it says that, um, you know, one, life isn't easy, uh, but life will reward you if you, if, you, if you put in the work. You know, if there's sweat equity there. Uh, freedom through discipline. You know, if, if you're disciplined and you work your ass off, eventually you're going to be rewarded for it. Uh, but it requires work. And, and I, I like to say that hard work sucks and not everybody's cut out for it. And that's, that, that goes with not just your job, you know, whether you're working in a cubicle or you're building houses or you're a ditch digger or a school teacher. Um, but it's also in your relationship. You know, and and uh, self improvement, all that shit. Work, you know, h- hard work sucks, and not everybody's cut out for it. Uh, and and that's one of the things I kind of live by. That and it's something I invented. I invented that. You know, that hard work sucks, and not everybody's cut out for it. But if you work freaking hard, eventually you are going to be rewarded. And and some people have a like a bleak out outlook. You know dude, all I do is work my freaking ass off and there's no light at the end of the tunnel, blah, 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 blah. Well, you're probably stuck in a rut. You're not looking for the next big thing, you know, and maybe you really aren't working your ass off. Maybe you're just in the mix, you know, you're in the grind, you're a cog in the system and you're not, you're not looking to level up. You're not looking for the next best thing. You're just accepting mediocrity. Yeah, there's a massive difference between being busy and achieving mm-hmm. something and actually getting right. shit done. And I've noticed that with a lot of like top performers, it's what can I do to make this better? How can I get incremental changes? 
you've worked with some of these amazing people, like through in different services, you've done collaborations with other units, etc. What do you notice about top performers that you teach with people you've worked with? Are there similarities in their habits, mindsets, just the way they approach life? Do you think that makes them so good? Yeah, you know what? Uh, with the top performers, one is um, usually they're pretty f- humble. That's, you know, there there's certain common denominators. One is they're pretty humble um, because that type of like humility will allow you uh, um, to um, have a little bit more like respect, you know, uh, it'll, it'll help you gain respect. Uh, the other thing is the top performers are very, they're self-governed. They put the extra work in and they put the extra work in when nobody's looking. They're not looking for applause or a pat on the back. Hell no. They're definitely not doing that. Um, but those are the big things. And usually they're, they're good listeners and good observers. You know, they're checking stuff out. They're not stuck in their own little bubble. They're not stuck in a vacuum. They are very observant. They are omnicognizant. They're looking at everybody, watching everybody, listening to everything. Um, but they're putting the extra work in when, when nobody's looking. Because it's something I've noticed with a lot of these sort of top performers is they're always looking to improve their training and because they realize they'll fall back to the highest level of their training, not the situation right. they're in. So they want to make sure that they, they're working their ass off, like you're saying, doing all these extra things and that. Um, I mean, it's not something I've noticed is like other operators have said, there's no, you're, you're just training all the time. You don't, you know, but then a lot of them put the extra emphasis on, I want to get better at X. I want to get better at Y. How do you get like assign the jobs that you're going to do in the unit? But how do you make sure that, you know, you're the good at combat, but you're also a specialist in that job you're given. <clears throat> how do you juggle these sort of conflicting demands? Cause it seems like to do one, it's hard to keep the others, you know, spin the other plates. Mm. Do you struggle with that? Or is that something they teach you to juggle the responsibilities? Yeah. You, you, you've got to learn how to prioritize, you know, uh, that, and that's a big, that's a, that's a pretty big deal, especially, you know, let's say you're a special ops guy and you're a family man, you know, uh, because you got to make time for, for home, for the kiddies, mm-hmm. for the wife, that kind of thing. So you got to make sure like little stuff, like your diet's on point, uh, that your sleep pattern is, 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 uh, on point as well. Uh, and then you have to prioritize, you have to maintain proficiency at all these other things, but all right. So I, I am not as good right here and I need to spend more time at this thing. You know what I did a lot of times is, um, I I brought my kids into work with me on the weekends. (laughs) So now I'm spending time with them, but I could work on like range stuff. You know, uh, I remember, yeah, I, I remember training for, uh, this thing called national match competition. Cause a guy told me, Hey, if you want to get better at competitive shooting, like IPSC, which is real fast, it's just running and gunning. He says, you should do national match, which is real boring. It's strong hand pistol shooting at distance, you know? So you're only using one hand. It's at distance it's at, on bullseyes. So I would bring my kids into work and I just sit them on the back of a uh, truck with headphones on and give them snacks. You know, so now I could do all my work and still spend time with them. And they had a blast. They would run around in the, in the grass and, um, uh, and, you know, but, but they got their, uh, their hearing protection on and eye protection on. Uh, so, it, you know, when you get that busy, you have to number one prioritize, but you can't let you like neglect your family. You know, the guys who didn't have family, they were all on their own. They didn't, they didn't care. They were, you know, they, they'd spend 12 hours at work you know, 12 hours a day. Uh, it, and it didn't have any adverse effect on their family because they didn't have one. <laughs> Think of the epic stories they're telling their pals as well. You know, like, right. what did you do at school? Well, like, you know, wait. So, I love how, like, <laughs> what, the passion you have in these interviews, you know, because you're always just, like, so full of, like, power and feeling a bit controlled. And you're always looking to, to help people better themselves. And mm-hmm. you, you talked about, where is it? It's up, attitude, aptitude, and a desire to become the best we can be. Where does, how do we start imparting that into us to become disciplined, to actually get off the couch and move our arses and get chasing our dreams, do you think? You know, I, I think we need to be inspired, right? 
uh, a lot of us need to be inspired. We need like a, a, a mentor or something. And you know what happened? I, for some reason, I found myself in that position, right? I'm the one who offers inspiration, but I get inspired from other people as well. But, um, uh, with this footprint on social media, I realized reading like the comments that guys are saying, thank you for getting me off the couch. And you just said that, how do we get people, how do we get ourselves off the couch? Mm. And I, and, and, but it's time and time again, where people will say, Hey, thank you. I was going to sit on my ass today, but I'm going to go work out. I'm going to go freaking, uh, build a shed or whatever it is, you know, cause I saw basic dude stuff. I'm going to learn some knots today. Uh, I'm going to teach my kid how to go fishing. I'm going to, um, buy a heavy bag and start to learn how to throw my fists. Uh, so I found myself in this unique position where I'm that guy who people look for, uh, to, for inspiration. And, but you know what that does on my lazy days, my fan base inspires me. <laughs> so now it's a give no. and take, you know, uh, because I know that it, because I'm not, I mean, I'm 57 years old now, you know, I'm, I, I didn't have this, don't have the same energy as when I was 47 or even 50. Um, so on those days when I don't feel like doing shit, I have to remember people are counting on me. They are counting on me. So I always thank my fan base for that. You know, I'm like, man, I'm so glad I have you because you need inspiration from me, but you are motivating me to get off of my ass because you are counting on me to inspire you. So it's kind of a weird dynamic that I have right now uh, because I, uh, a lot of, um, a lot of days I don't have the sa same motivation. I am working off of discipline. Uh, and, but it's a, it's a very unique position because, um, yeah, I, I inspire people, but, but they're counting on me. So they're inspiring me too. It's like that when you see these babies, like where their parents, when they work out, the baby copies the parent and they're saying, it's like the kid doesn't do what you tell it to do. The kid will do what you do. So be the inspiration. And it's like that on social media as we want you to, to be that person that inspires us to do it. And then that gives you that kind of, yeah, I've got to go do it. I've got to make another video. I've got to inspire the people. And you're certainly doing that. Like, you know, there's love in the comments and people are going, you've completely changed my life. Now, right. as you can, as you can probably see from my face, I started, I carried on eating like I was still training jujitsu and all that during COVID. So I put on a lot of weight. So how do we build our combat chassis? How do we build the body? Because you've got this whole great series on, it's this style of car, if you've just started this style of car, you know, yeah. you really get into it. How do we start getting, oh yeah, my knee's sore. How do we get past that? Oh, uh, I used to lift in high school and go outside. Yeah, now, let's go. You know, we're, we're, we're riddled with excuses, right? So mm -hmm. one of the things I do is I help mitigate, I call it mitigating excuses. Uh, so when it comes to excuses to like exercise, there's several common denominators. One is time. I don't have the time. Another one is I don't have the equipment. Uh, I don't have the money to join a gym. Um, uh, I have aches and pains. Uh, those kind of things. So I mm. mitigate all of that crap. I mean, you see my gym on the inter interwebs. It's in my driveway. <laughs> it's you know, so I'm not going to – yeah, I walk out of my – uh, house and go to my driveway. Uh, and it's very Spartan. I don't have a Olympic people say, you don't do Olympic lifts or anything. I, I don't, I don't need to, I don't need to, to maintain a good level of practical functional fitness. I do not need a bunch of Olympic weights. I don't need a bunch of, uh, to spend a bunch of money. You know, I could use bands and hammers and, and push around my golf cart and I'm fine. But back to your question, but to answer your question, um, people have to understand, you know, when they, like, if they see me working out there, go, oh man, I'll never be able to do that. Well, not right now. <laughs> yeah, not right mm -hmm. now, but you got to start somewhere. So the first step is just show up. I, I tell people that all the time, just show up it, it, and before that even. So I have a new thing, uh, before showing up, uh, dress the part. <laughs> so dress the part. So get all dressed up, get into your combat gear. And mine is just a headband. If I put my headband on, it's like it's putting on my, yeah, it's like putting on my Batman cape. You know, that means I have to go do business because trust me on this, Ian, there's uh, tons of days right now where I am not motivated. 
you know, and, 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 and it, there's a, uh, I have a, uh, some health issues, uh, plus it's the age thing, but, um, there's tons of days where I don't feel mo- motivated. So I know I need to show up and before I show up, I'm going to put on my headband and then whatever t-shirt, maybe just shorts. If it's hundred freaking degrees outside. Um, and then I show up and I cr- start cranking on the tunes. Uh, because I get motivated by metal. <laughs> but the other thing is, uh, with a lot of people, let's say they want to uh, improve their combat chassis, because that was one of the questions you asked. You've got to adjust the diet. It's That's huge, because it's so easy for us to eat. Eating unhealthy is easy. It's very easy. Uh, so what I tell people when they have a very unhealthy diet, you know, full of, you know, they're, they're eating shit out of boxes and bags, which isn't food, right? If it comes in a box or a bag, it's a product. It's not food. So I just tell them, Hey, cut out one of those things right now. Just one. Cause you can't go from eating like a human garbage can to a perfect freaking diet overnight. You're cause you're not going to stick with it. There's no freaking way. So cut one piece of shit out, whether it's those freaking four um, Coca-Colas that you drink a day or um, those candy bars or that bag of chips at night. Cut out one of those freaking sh- pe- those uh, th- those things in your diet that is shit because, you know, shit in, shit out. Right. So your 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 body is turning into shit when you're ingesting shit. Uh, Just cut out one, one of those things and then start slow Uh, because we have to understand that. Uh, The other thing that people say was if they look at my workouts is I'll never be able to do that. Well, start slow and adjust it, you know, modify it to fit your needs because I I run whenever I train people, I I call it performance-based training. So performance-based training understands that we all perform differently and performance can be measured by doing what we can with what we have. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you have to adjust, you know, that kind of workout or exercise to meet your needs, start slow. And, 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 and then, and then here's the, the big, the big thing is this, you got to, you got to give yourself three months, three months. So let's say you cut out that, that one piece of shit from your diet after a week, you might think to yourself, you know what? I feel better already. So cut out a second one and then maybe a third a month later. But in three months, if you start exercising and your diet gets better, uh, there's a couple things that happen in three months. One is you're going to see results that stick instead of going on a crash diet. You know, people go on a crash diet three weeks. I lost 16 pounds in three weeks. Yeah. Well, but you're going to gain it right back next week. Uh, Next week. Yeah. Right back. Um, but three months you, you lose those 16 pounds, you know, it's like, holy shit, man, that's good. But now it's going to stick. Not only that, but the, the fitness level that you have, uh, acquired is also going to stick. And the third thing is, um, after three months, it kind of becomes a way of life. It becomes a new normal, but you've got to give it those three months. And what I mean by starting out slow is, go for a freaking walk, (laughs) you know, something like that. Go for a freaking, don't, don't go out tomorrow and turn on the Rocky soundtrack and and try to uh, run through uh, city blocks with bricks in your hand and, and, and just freaking a half dozen of raw eggs, you know, go for a freaking walk, Um, you know, invest in some uh, resistance bands, a couple uh, kettlebells or something and, and start, just start slow, just start slow, you know, because you want to make those, and you said it earlier, because I love this term. You want to make those incremental improvements, incremental, incremental, because those incremental improvements are going to stick with you. But those are the big things right there. You know, how do I get off the couch, dress the part, show up, cut out one piece of shit from your diet. (laughs) And you know, it's, it's great too to keep a log, you know, keep, keep a journal, uh, this is how much I weigh. This is my waist. See, that's a big one because a lot of people are, uh, they're, um, at the mercy of a scale. The BMI well, the, crew. Yeah. But a scale, uh, uh, can be false negatives, false positives, because if you're gaining muscle and losing fat, you're not going to lose weight. So what you need is that like tape measure around your waist 
you know, that kind of thing, because that's a real thing or count the amount of uh, belt uh, holes in, in your, in your belt, you know, that you're like, holy shit, man, I got to go to another belt hole, you know, to buckle my belt because I've lost three inches around my waist. Yeah. But the log is a good thing. Too. Cause it's definitely something I did. Like I started walking again and I cut out drinking soda and I, it was just like, I was looking at my diet thinking it's not too bad. And then I looked at what I ate, and ate that day and I was like, shit, you know, you wouldn't put like crap into a Ferrari and expect it to drive. Yeah. Right, why are we doing right. that with our bodies? And I was right. like, shit. <laughs> like, you know, when you start looking at your, tra- cause like, I love your style of training. It's the functional training. Like, you know, yes. um, I don't know if you know the SAS guy, Chris Ryan. Um, uh, I, I, I think I've heard of him. Because he was one of the ones where he has a, a, a manual on how to work out. And he's saying, like, you know, you don't need any. You can go to a tree and do pull-ups and do dips off it. And I love that about the, S, like the SES, the SEALs, etc. You'll be going into jungle, desert, uh, deserts everywhere, using the resources you have there, like stones, logs, whatever. Do you think that's a problem is that people go, oh, I can't do it because I've got the gym? Because you say we need to train for the worst-case scenarios. How how do you get that through to people? It's they don't. If somebody's coming to rob you, they're not caring that you can't go to the gym that day. It's right. what you've got there and then. How do you train for the worst case scenario? Do you think? Oh uh, well, uh, it, well. One thing that I'm going to tell you too, because you reminded me of something here. Um, uh, when people have excuses, you know. Um, uh, when I'm working with a guy on the range and I could see that he's overweight, but he's got good footwork, you know, and maybe he's right around 40 years old or so. I say, dude, man, you have good footwork. What was the sport that you played in high school or college? You know, say, oh, baseball, or I was a tennis or, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I boxed or whatever it is. And I'll say, do you have kids? And he'll go, yeah, yeah. How old? And I'll say, how old are your kids? And I'll go, bro, you got to be around for those kids, man. Imagine that footwork 20 or 30 pounds lighter. And they'll go, yeah, you're right. But it, that'll, that'll, you know, uh, uh, reprogram, instant reprogramming. And a lot of those guys, I'll see them six months later, a year later, and I'll go, yeah, you look familiar. Were you in a course of mine? Yeah, I was, but that was 60 pounds lighter or heavier, <laughs> you know? I was like, holy shit, bro. But anyway, this, so that's part of it, right? How do we train for worst case scenario? Um, one is... What is, what's your focus? Is it protecting your family? Is it protecting yourself? Because you've probably heard me say this is, there's four reasons why we should exercise. And I think these are important. Uh, And, and I think more and more people are going to catch on to this because this is max philosophy on, on why we should exercise. It's not about cosmetics. Cosmetics is a byproduct, right? We want to look good. Hell yeah, man. I want to look freaking good. I want chiseled abs. I want pets. You know, I don't want to get man boobs when I'm 60, but there's four reasons why we should work out. One, this is the big one, right? Self-preservation, longevity, stronger, longer. I want to be as fit and healthy for as long as possible. I have one life to live on this planet. One, I want to enjoy it for as long as I can, you know, instead of being couch ridden or in a wheelchair or in a walker when I'm 75. I want to, I want to be able to, you know, go to, I don't know, Machu Picchu when I'm 80, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, Mm -hmm. So self-preservation, longevity, number one. The next thing is the ability to save your own life. You got to be able to save your own life. More importantly, especially if you're family, man, you've got to be able to save somebody else's life. So that's number three. And the last one is Mm -hmm. the ability to kick somebody's freaking ass. You know, like that ballistic micro fight. And I'm not, I'm not talking, you have to be a good fighter, but if you get, you know, you're fixing to get mugged by three freaking ruffians, uh, in a dark street and you're with your family, it's like, holy shit, man. And then they start getting physical. You've got to be able to, you know, ballistic micro fight, just start throwing and kicking and grabbing and pulling and punching and, (laughs) <laughs> it's when you see these guys going oh i could win every fight they've never been in a fight oh i could get that girl they've never approached a girl in their life but every guy thinks they can win the fight and get the girl and you, it's an unfortunate situation because you know reality is going to snap the shit out of them mm-hmm. do you think that's a thing like when i do brazilian jiu-jitsu again i've started up again loving it weights coming off but you have to get comfortable being uncomfortable and i know you yes. have that from like the service because you would have had 
constant valuation, constant reviews, constant like schools and checks and things like that. Do you think that's something we're struggling with? We're no longer being challenged. We're we're not getting this. And you know, how do we get this in an everyday life? Do you think? See, the, the, yes, we're not. We're not unless it's self imposed, right? Um, like I like that be, be, being comfortable, being uncomfortable comfortable as an example tomorrow tomorrow I, I leave for montana uh once a year i go into the wilderness uh because i am i know i'm going to be uncomfortable i know i've got a hump pack i know i'm going to be hungry uh, 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 an ice storm might move in you know on me and it might freeze one it's going to freeze every night but um uh but i might get uh uh, uh you know inclement weather could put move in at any freaking second and I might get hammered with inclement weather. Um, but I'll do stuff like that throughout the year. You know, I'll, I'll do events or go out into the woods and put myself in uncomfortable positions just to write, remind myself, number one, I'm human. I'm not invincible. Um, I am vulnerable to mother nature. That's the big one, right? So mother, mm. nobody, uh, uh, is, uh, um, safe or is, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Nobody is, uh, um, like free from the effects that mother nature can impose on you. You know, everybody can be affected by mother nature, by cold, by dark, oh, yeah. by wind, by rain, all that crap. So I put myself out in the elements as much as possible. And with my job, I have to do that. You know, when I'm on the range in the winter or in the summer, when it's blazing freaking hot and super humidity, you know, super humid, and I've got several days on the range, that's a suck fest. Or when it's winter and the, the rain's coming in sideways and it's just above the freezing point and the wind is honking. So you got the trifecta there. It sucks freaking bad. But oh, yeah. I, it's a good reminder, you know, that I am still, I am vulnerable. You know, Mother Nature can jack me up uh, because I am not superhuman, especially when it comes to Mother Nature. So, yeah, I like putting myself in those positions just to remind myself that I am I am pretty meek. <laughs> it's time for a quick break. There are millions of potential products to buy. So how do you know which ones are worth your hard earned money? Simple. You go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and explore those that will transform and improve your life. You'll find deals, listener exclusives, and special offers with some great companies. Recommendations are 100% honest and only on items Ian has tried or believes in. The companies showcased will make you a better man in all areas of your life. Simply go to nextlevelguy.com slash affiliates and level up. I love, that's a great answer because... You, you know, I think COVID made everybody realize they are not prepared for shit. You know, like I yeah. came from the Highlands of Scotland and people were, so you're in the rain, you're in the snow, you're in the wind all the time. You come down here, everybody's got their heaters on in the office and they're all used to having full bellies and warm rooms and all. They, they can't do anything when shit hits the fun. And I love how you kind of like you and other operators I've spoken to have just go, fear's going to be there. I want to go and learn. I want to push myself into it to get that comfort zone past and get to the point where you know it's going to be there. You know you're going to feel it. But it's almost going to be like, that's just telling me something's not right. I need to fix this. I need to fix that. How do you learn about fear in the forces? And what have you learned to, to teach people? You know, how, do, how should we adopt it and learn from it and not feed it? Uh, 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 fear. Mm -hmm. How? how so sort of fear anxiety of changing right. or to actually go out and do stuff like that, you know, rather than just talk about it, but to actually go, I'm going to go challenge myself outside. I'm going to make a personal mm -hmm. transformation. How do we make ourselves go and do that and not let us go? Oh no, it, it looks too scary. It's I'm too, I can't do that because of the kids or whatever. I, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure how, let's say if you've never done it, how, how you would go about uh, doing it. I think, um, one of the things if is if there's that doubt like that, oh no, no, that's too scary. Um, then, um, I think it, you're already defeated. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? If, if, if you're already accepting 
the fact that you can't. You know, if can't is in your vocabulary, oh, no, no, I can't do that. It's way, it, that, that should be way right. too freaking hard. Um, then you're already a defeatist and, and um, you need an attitude adjustment. Um, and just like the working out thing, I think people need to start out slow with that. You know, if they've always lived in a, in like lap of luxury or they've always been comfortable, then it'd be hard to break that mold, to come out of that. It'd be, re I, I could only imagine that it would be extremely difficult because I do know people uh, that in my mind, in my imagination, I know that they have never been uncomfortable. You know, they've never, ever, they've never been frostbit. They've never, um, you know, had a broken bone and go, well, there's another broken bone, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yes. you know, that it, I, but I know people like that. Um, I mean, I'm not in cahoots with them and I'm not going to share a beer with them, but, but I have talked to people like that, you know, and um, I think that uh, they are not going to voluntarily put themselves into a situation like that. I think it's going to have to slap them in the face, sort of like coronation right because that slapped a lot of people in the face yeah it's like holy shit i'm comfortable my whole, whole life now locked down and it caught people with their pants down didn't it all these comfortable people people who aren't prepared for shit caught they got all they all got caught with their pants down you know what i did i partied my ass off <laughs> you know it was the one of the best they could i now i know people suffered right i understand that and i empathize and um so my wife and I did a lot of stuff for charity, you know, during that lockdown, because we couldn't stand the thought of hungry kids in our county. So yeah. we generated Anything businesses good? online. Yeah, mm -hmm. we generated business online. Now, we, um, I still partied my ass off, right? Because, it, because I wasn't working anymore. I wasn't traveling my ass off anymore. You know, it was lockdown. I mean, because before lockdown, I was doing four courses a month and getting on an airplane for most of them. And I did this, this temple for 10 years. So it, when lockdown hit, number one is um, I prep, right? So I have, I prep, I have gasoline, I have generators, I have toilet paper, you know, I have wet wipes, I have first aid, mm -hmm. I have food, I have water, I have all of this stuff. So we needed nothing. We didn't have to go to the, we, we even made beer. You know, we bought a brew kit and made beer and, um, cause that was, well, that was a lesson learned. The only hmm. thing we were short of during communication was booze and I, you know, I'm going to have a couple of drinks every night. So that was the only thing yeah, that. that we, that we were lacking. Hmm. So I, I thought, well, that's a void. We recognize the void. Let's, let's learn how to make beer. Yep. So, uh, but we, um, um, but we, we weren't uncomfortable, but I know my point is, I know a lot of people got caught with their pants down. They were uncomfortable. And a lot of those people who were uncomfortable were never uncomfortable before. Oh my God, what am I going to do? This is freaking horrible. Blah, 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 blah. Well, you know what too? Those same people who had to go to and uh, run to the store and find toilet paper. they will be the same ones doing it next time. You yeah. know, if there's another lockdown, there's another, uh, there'll be this, it'll be the same freaking people. Yeah. I mean, I've been standing on the top of a hill waiting for it. Like we, we've got sheep, um, you know, like hundreds of sheep, waiting for one to lamb while it's being sleet in your face and stuff like that. And, you know, you get people who go, I can't go out yet. It's a tiny drizzle or it's too right. cold or I'll get a taxi. <laughs> and you're like, you're fucked. Like, you know, as soon as that happens, just give, give out. And I think, do you think by introducing daily habits, like cold showers, um, I don't know, like just slight discipline to kind of build them into this mindset. Because you talk about how to keep the blaze alive in our current mm -hmm. lives. How do you start with somebody who has never even started the kindling, shall we say? Yeah, right. That um, Now, I, 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 I've rarely dealt with those who have mm -hmm. never started. The people I deal with had had fire once before. They've, they've, right. they've had it before. So, um, I don't know if I've ever had somebody from ground zero like that. You know what I mean? Because that would be real tough to inspire them. But if the guy had fire before and he, he, he found himself in a deep, dark hole, he gained a bunch of weight. Um, he, he starts getting depressed. 
it's a lot easier to, cause that, and I call it, you know, if he's still got an ember, if he's still got an ember, I could ignite that. I could ignite that ember. I could nurture right. that ember and, and make a flame. And then with that flame, all I'm going to do is just put up just a, a little bit of kindling on there and I'm going to hand him that flame, dude. Now keep that blaze alive. You have to do this. And, and with those guys who like they, they because they've, they felt, um, you know, pain before, or they've been miserable. They've been cold. They've been wet. They've been tired. They've been hungry. They've been scared. Uh, <laughs> with those people, it's a lot easier because that's in their data bank somewhere, even though most of them forgot it, it's still etched in their hard drive, you know, so they have to go into the recesses of their data bank and remember who they once were. And it's, it, it became my job to remind him or just to, just to, just to, just to hand him that flame, that little flickering flame, you know, uh, but, uh, but it, it would be a neat experience. I don't, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I ever have taken somebody from like, from, from scratch, you know, uh, you know, so blank, blank slate. Uh, somebody who's lived just a, a lap of luxury, comfortable life. I think that would be hard to kick them in the ass. You know, let's, let's say like somebody um, <clears throat> who is a career politician, they've never had a job in their life or like a, like a freaking actor, you know, or really? somebody like that always lived, right. Uh, who's always lived a la- uh, 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 life of luxury. I'm not sure I could kick them in the ass or not. Or I'm not sure I, I could tolerate it. I'm not sure I'd have the patience. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I, think, I think that's part of it. You've got to want it. You know, you've got to stop and say, like, my dad's type 2 diabetic and um, mm-hmm. recently come on to insulin and he will not make a change to save himself. Like, you know, he's overweight. He won't exercise. He sleeps all the time. And I want to just say to him, what the fuck are you doing? But I realized I can't be the one that does that. I've got to let him say, you know, like these guys, I've, I want to change. Then they come to you, the likes of yourself and go, I'm going to do a course on this. And then you rekindle, like you get that fire going again. And I think that's something is we've got to do it ourselves. And I love how you've got this like basic dude series where here's the skills that you can put. And it's a treasure trove of some amazing oh, stuff yeah. mixed I, in with some bizarre things. So, you know, they're shooting yeah, yeah, stuff yeah. in with how to, how I got into draw, um, following birds and right. all this, all the stuff in the world you could think of. How yeah. do you get people to understand that? You know, you've got a great way of looking at it. Like, can you kick the clone of you yesterday's arse? Right. Can you? Right, make right. It? How can you beat yourself? The, again, as incremental changes. How do mm-hmm. we start going through your series of skills and going? I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. How how do we build these into our lives? Do you think? Well, once again, it's inspiration, right? We need to find inspiration from somewhere. Mm-hmm. And that line right there, that was a cool line I came up with a couple of years ago. You know, where I told somebody, hey. If, if you cloned yourself yesterday, can you kick your clone's ass tomorrow? And they're looking at me like, I'm not talking about, you know, becoming a martial artist, maybe better balance or, or learning a skill, <laughs> you know, or, um, being able to cook something that, because it, it always drives me crazy when a guy can't cook. It's like, bro, what the fuck is wrong with you, man? <laughs> I mean, this is something that I think it's, is, it, it, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's empowering, man. And, and dude should know how to freaking cook a meal. But um, I think once again, we need inspiration from somewhere. And with the basic dude stuff series, man, that, that I never, ever, ever would have imagined the power and the influence of that series when I first came up with it. it because awesome. I was, yeah, I was, I was, I mean, I was, it was drunken nonsense when I came up with it. It was just <laughs> my wife and I were in the, in the living room together and uh, we were chit chatting and I was pretty smashed. I was drinking bourbon. I was in my range of panties and, and we chit chat like schoolgirls, you know? Um, and we were talking about installing appliances and I told her I could do it. And she was really, I said, yeah, man, I know all this stuff, you know, the basic stuff that dude should know how to do. And I kept saying this, you know, I, I kept saying it all over, over and over, you know, the, not the advanced stuff, but the, 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 the basic stuff, you know, that dude should know, you know, and then it came out the basic dude stuff. I went, I need to write that down. Basic dude stuff, basic dude stuff. But, um, it, 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 that thing exploded in no time. I mean, to the point where um, I had to get it. 
I had to get it trademarked. <laughs> I mean, that's how big it got. It got so big so fast. I, re- I it was already getting plagiarized a couple months in. Oh, um, so is it? Yeah. So I, inst- I was like, oh, got to uh, secure that intellectual property. You know, if you ever have a good idea, good is something I tell people because I've had a bunch of good ideas. One is tell as few people as possible and then secure that intellectual property, man. <laughs> Get it legal. <laughs> Get it. Yeah. Legalize that thing. So, so nobody else could snatch it from you. But the, but um, here's another thing that happened with basic dude stuff. This was unintended and couldn't forecast it in a million years. Little kids. I have a massive little kid following. <clears throat> so, which means it's like at the beginning when I first started doing them, I had some stuff in there with beer or cigar and cigars and that, that kind of thing. Um, I cut all that crap out, you know, because I have to assume that a big part of my audience are little kids mm-hmm. because they love it, man. I get, I get video clips of Kids doing basic dude stuff from all over the planet. I mean, even in non-English speaking countries, they'll say whatever it is they're doing. And then in English, they'll say basic dude stuff. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's, they, it's, ama- it's amazing. It's amazing. My, uh, one of my nephews has got Jocko Wilnick's book, The Way of the Kid. You know, and he's always coming out with these snippets and he does uh, like a jam board. You know, these kind of, it's like, um, what do you call it? Uh, like PowerPoint, but it's like, you know, a steal a bit of this, put a bit of this, pictures and videos. And he does it for school and he's showing all his friends and they're loving it. And they're like that, you know, because they never see that stuff. And I think that's what COVID really hit home was. Most people don't know shit. I come from the Highlands and you're two hours away from the neatest like parts shop. So if you're, yeah. if you're like moving fish or something and you know, your oxygen tanks go, you've got to fix it there and then. It's, I suppose it's a very poor example of like what this forces would go. So like, how do you get taught to deal with pressure situations when bullets are flying? You know, because people say, "Oh, box breathing." Oh, well, calm you down. Yeah. How do you how do you start going? Okay, this is a pressurized situation. I'm doing X. I'm focusing on that. How do you stop caring about what's happening there because you know your missions is this and you're going to get it done. <laughs> So uh, are you, you're talking about compartmentalizing like um, fear and pressure. Well, it's just like, cause people immediately go, Oh no, I can't do that. I'll have to get a guy in. But with COVID, that's not going to be possible. You know, right. like, how do you get them to kind of realize it's like, stop panicking, oh. breathe through the, the stress, the anxiety, because you've done it with bullets flying and missiles and all the bad shit. How do you say to somebody like, look, man up, but how do you do it in a way right. that they can re- relate to? Because we've, we've all been shot at. And it, that's a hard one. See, like you working, you know, uh, with that example, you had to be self-reliant, right? Yeah. You had to be, learn how to fix your own shit. And you had to work out in inclement weather and, you know, all that. Um, I can't so believe just, some of the stuff people can't do. And I'm like, yeah, what? It's amazing. It's amazing. It's amazing. Now, I, I went over, um, I went to a dude's house. I was invited. Um, to meet, um, uh, there was a uh, celebrity that I knew that was in town and she was at, uh, a house, a friends of hers house. And, um, she invited Rebecca and I to come and visit her at this stranger's house. I didn't know these people. Uh, but they had a, um, there was something in the kitchen that went wrong. And, and I said, oh, I could, I could fix that for you. Uh, just let me see your tools. The dude had no tools. This is a man, a grown ass man. He had no tools. He had a chinks, chintzy pair of pliers in a junk drawer. So like somebody like, I mean, I was looking at him like, dude, you're, you're a man and you have no tools in a home. You're a home owner. I know. You have people. no fucking tools, bro. Are you kidding me? I mean, I was my, see the, here's the thing, man. I, I don't know a lot of people like that. You know, in my life, you know, it, it, the, the people with, with whom I associate, um, I don't know those people. I don't know those other people, people with no tools. So running into a guy like that, what am I going to say to him? You need to be more self-reliant. He'd look at me like I have a dick growing out of my forehead. <laughs> I, there's, I don't know if I'd be able to get through to him. 
I mean, but I, I remember glancing at his wife too, and she was like, yeah. Mm. I mean, she was, she, 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 she it, it, it was, she wasn't uh, um, dumbfounded either. I was dumbfounded. I was blown away. So with people like that, man, I don't know. I think something bad has to happen, right? Where they have to be self-reliant. Mm-hmm. Um, now, a lot of people changed mindset during COVID, right? During lockdown. A lot of people did. A lot of people said, you know what, what else they said too is I need to learn, like with all the riots that were here in 2020, um, a lot of people said, I need to learn how to protect my family. I need to learn mm-hmm. how, whether it, you know, um, just being more situationally aware, um, having a good communication system. I'm not talking about going out and buying guns, having a flashlight on hand, uh, just little shit like that. A lot of people learn from that, from their mistakes or for their, for their uh, shortfalls. But not everybody did, man. Like I said, those same people who didn't learn are the same people who during next time they're going to be out looking for toilet paper. You know, that guy who has no tools, everything in his house is going to break and he's going to call somebody to fix it. He's going to call a plumber to, 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 to tighten a freaking um, uh, a fitting, you know, an elbow fitting. He's going to call a plumber for that shit. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. I, 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 I don't think I've ever run it in, because like that guy, I will never associate with somebody like that. <laughs> I've, and- I mean, is that what you're sort of taught in the military? It's like how to do it in a pressurized situation. So you're taught to like multiple repetitions. So it gets a point where you can do it with your eyes closed. And, you know, like, you know, like you've got some great videos of dismantling weapons and putting them back together and cleaning them. You know, you get to a point where you don't just know the skill. It's part of you. It's just part of your being, do you think? Yeah. And, and, and another thing is with... Um, uh, this is especially in special ops. I don't care whether it's in the UK, in Australia, in freaking Germany or the US. With special ops units, the all the good units train for worst case scenario. You know what I mean? So it's mm-hmm. all pressure coated drills. Nothing ever freaking works out perfectly, you know, in training scenarios. There's always some kind of catastrophe, fiasco, uh, mass casualty. It's, it, it's all so when when you end up going in into into a combat operation they're usually a lot easier than than training scenarios <laughs> really yeah i mean was that the inspiration behind writing sentinel you wanted the people to kind of understand that you know just be aware of that shady knob guy down the road be aware of like what weapons you have, how you're set up, but you're, because I think that's a whole other podcast, that and self-defense. We could talk for hours, I think, on these sort of things. How do you even start, like, you know, gun fundamentals and stuff like that? How do you get somebody to exp- understand they're the king of the castle, but they, they have to protect people in their car, their house, their... Yeah, so, um, you know... It, 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 I have a couple points. I'm hoping I can remember all these. So the inspiration behind Sentinel, it's, this is freaking funny. It's, it, it wasn't like I was thinking about other people initially. Mm. Um, I just trained some uh, Marine Corps special ops, some MARSOC guys. This was in 2000. And when did I write that book? 13 or something like that, 2012. But anyway, one of the guys from the MARSOC unit said, hey, uh, can you do me a favor? Um, I'm going into um, doing some – some low level uh, protection stuff. Can you jot me down some notes on what I should prepare myself for? And at the time too, I, I, I was dealing with a really bad relationship, right? So it was a tail end of a really bad marriage and I was sleeping in the bonus room above my garage. So it was just me and a computer and a small TV uh, and a couple of bottles of booze. And uh, <laughs> anyway, I, so I thought about this guy and I sat down at the computer and I started typing. And I typed for 17 hours straight, 17 hours. And I realized as I was doing this, I I went, damn, man, I know a lot of stuff. It was amazing because it was all back in the data bank. You know, it was all in the recesses of the data bank and it was just spilling out. And, you know, I was just 
throw an idea onto paper, just cha, just typing. And then I'd think of another paragraph or chapter. And I, would, I would say, all right, hold on. Space, 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 space. Let me get this down too before I forget it. Just cha, 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 cha. just tapping away. And then pretty soon I had 50 pages. And I went, let me turn this into a book. <laughs> and then I started thinking about other people's welfare. You know, mm. how can we on a small level, right, micro level, become the agent in charge of our own executive protection detail. So you take what, you know, the, these massive executive protection details do with, 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 you know, 20 freaking man team, and now you're one dude and you got your principal or your PC, your precious cargo, or your, your, maybe your two little kids and your wife. You know, so how do I protect them how is it that i could protect them uh and i had another point here so a lot of people um ping me on that one and they were like dude thank you so much i've made improvements in my life because of the sentinel book and from other countries too it's like i i don't have a gun but i carry a flashlight and a pocket knife wherever i go now at least you know and i have a small first aid kit it's like hell yeah bro good for you you know you that's something you know it's something um and with a lot of these people too something bad happened to them and they weren't prepared. Hmm. So, and, and, and that's usually what I call putting a rubber band around your neck and snapping the fuck out of it. In order for a lot of these softies, these marshmallows to get off their asses and to work out, to, to do self-defense, to, um, you know, learn to protect themselves, to maybe, uh, harden their, um, their fortress, a little bit to be a little less complacent to be a little more uh situationally aware usually something freaking bad has happened has to happen to them and i don't wish that on anybody i want them to do this before something bad happens to them. now another point i was going to bring up it's so funny um for years i've been doing sunday sentinel sermons right so just a quick um little uh public safety announcement. And and I was, I started, I think I started doing them in 2017. So they're just little snippets from the Sentinel book. And so many times I remember doing one in 2019 and, uh, uh, and I showed some of the, my prep stuff, not all of it, just some of it. And in one post, I think I got three comments where people said, bro, you're fucking paranoid. As you know, you don't, you don't entertain that with a, with it. I'm, I, but, and, and I, but I tell people in my classes, I'm not paranoid. I'm just prepared. But r- shortly after that, it uh, COVID in the lockdown. And I was like, who's paranoid now, motherfucker? <laughs> that's, that's the thing is everybody always assumes they know better you know, because they always assume that what's happened now will remain now. And right. wh- when you've grown up having to pick up like a couple of weeks supply and to take back to your home village and of food and stuff like that, and you know you can't just nip out and buy something, you know you realize it's like some people don't know the world's going to bite them in the ass. And you see mm-hmm. these kids nowadays with participation trophies. We I mean mm-hmm. I grew up in a generation the winner won, you second or third place maybe got a small trophy, that was it. You learn from that to try harder next it's time. Very- very, very important for young kids to learn how to freaking get their asses kicked to, to lose. Hmm. It's very important for development, you know, for healthy development. You have to freaking lose because like I said, you know, when I wrestled, I lost nonstop for two years. But at the end of that second year, when I won, finally, when I won a match, that victory was sweet, man. That was work. That was effort. Yeah. But if I always got a participation trophy, that victory would have had nothing. It wouldn't have, because that victory changed my fucking life. I swear to God, it did. That one victory, that first victory I had changed my life because I wanted more of that. I wanted to be victorious. And one victory changed my life. One, one. You know, that was, that, there was a, uh, it, like an amalgamation of events that happened all at the same time when I was like 14 years old. And that was one of them. Winning. You know, the feeling of victory when you yeah. earned it. It was the first time I ever felt it, like real victory, where people clapped. You know what I mean? <laughs> but now with the, everybody winning in participation trophies and shit like that, where, where's, where's, where's a sense of accomplishment? And then what? Uh, where's my motivation to be better if I'm going to always win? Hey, no, where is it's, it's a very good point. I mean, that's what you learn in jiu-jitsu is it doesn't matter how tough you think you are. 
the 150 pound girl is going to armbar you because you don't know the technique you don't know what the hell you're doing and how many people have that in their lives again none yeah I can't, I can't so believe we've been on for an hour. Like, you know, it's, it feels like yeah, 10 good. minutes. <laughs> I'm going to take my wife out to dinner. <laughs> um, are you okay for a few more minutes just to, to wrap up? Or yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Let's see. Um, now, I would love to have you on again and do a round two because it's been an absolute pleasure. Easy, 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 um, easy. What would you want people to take from this as a sort of go-home message? Because I know we could go down 50 different rabbit holes for another couple hours in each of them. What would well, you want uh, people to remember? There's a bunch of it, right? So here's the big one. And we just fit, kind of culminated, but the entire, this entire episode can be, can be culminated by this right here. And I say this in my Sentinel courses, we don't plan to fail, but we fail to plan. And when we do, we get experience mm -hmm. and experience is something we get shortly after we need it. Right. So, um, and that, and, and that's in the working out and the being uncomfortable, you know, being uncomfortable, you know, working out in the mist and the rain and the, and all that shit. Um, or, um, learning to protect yourself, your family, getting fit. We don't plan to fail, but we fail to plan, you know, having provisions, uh, provisions, learning how to garden, how to be self-sustained, you know, go, build a freaking garden. Yeah. You don't have a big backyard. It doesn't matter. You could, you could build a couple raised beds and, and, ha and grow some food. <laughs> you know, you could grow some beans and, and stuff and stuff you could jar. You know, and, and you could have it on your shelves and you're not going to need that. But, but when you do, it's there, you have food and you grew this and you learned how to jar, you learned how to pickle stuff, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, so I think that's the entire episode could be summed up by saying that, you know, that's like my brother, he had the apocalypse boxes, you know, filled with dry foods and stuff. And after COVID, he was like, who was right? Who was wrong? You know, you're like, fuck. <laughs> <Bravo>. <laughs> And how can we keep in touch with you? You know, I mean, apart from buying the great books, listening to the, the, the podcast, how would you want people to sort of interact with your material to like contact you and social media and just join the brotherhood of badassery? So I have uh, almost all of my uh, information is on uh, under T Max Inc. So whether my website, my IG, so T M A C S I N C. You know, so most everything's there. I have an online coaching squad. Uh, it's called the Pat Matt Keep the Blaze Live Coaching Squad on Patreon, uh, and that's a good thing, man, because it's great shareware. There's a there's a massive skill set within the, the squad members, and they're from all over the world. The squad members. So there's a couple things that I've got a good informative YouTube channel. Pat Mac, P A T M A C. Well, that's it for another week, and thank you for listening. It's now time to take what you've learned and use it to develop and enhance your life with the key points mentioned. Listen, try it, embrace it, use it, and crush it. Now's your time to hit that next level in your life. If you liked this episode, then please leave a comment on the show notes or a review of the show on your podcast platform. Everything helps evolve the show. Until next week, keep seeking the next level in your life.